Okay, I think we are going to get started. Um, there might be some more people joining us as we um, move along here, but that is okay. Uh, welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us this evening for a book talk with Colin Melantis on his latest book, Deep River. My name is Dina Cowan. I am the Educational and Cultural Programs Manager here at the National Nordic Museum and I am very happy to uh, welcome you tonight. It's an honor to have Carl Melantis here and it's so great to have so many of you um, at this program. We wish we could meet in person, but since we can't, this is uh, the next best thing. And as I mentioned a couple of times to avoid distractions as much as possible, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cameras and mute your microphones. And then also I want to ask you to post your questions in the chat function on your screen. And then at the end, we will leave enough time to get those answered as many as possible. Before we dive into our program, I want to mention that if you have not yet read Deep River, you will want to do so after tonight's talk. We have Deep River for sale here at the museum's gift store. And uh, we have the hardcover uh, version and we are offering that as a, uh, with a 10% discount. And that is on top of the 15% discount you get as a member. Being a member at the museum is a great way to support us and what we do. And uh, not only do you support us, but you do get benefits. And one of them is discounts in the museum store. But the book is also available now as paperback. And you can find that as at local bookstores. We have Third Place Books and we have Elliott Bay Bookstore. And those, they also have online uh, options. Deep River, as we will talk about here uh, about tonight, uh, is inspired in part by Carl Melanta's own family's story. And if you're interested in researching your own family's history, we have a great opportunity for you later in September when we are launching our first ever genealogy conference. It's a two day event and you can find more information about that on our website and I highly recommend it. But now I know you're not here to listen to me. You want to hear uh, Carl Melantis talk, and so do I. It is my very great pleasure to welcome Carl here tonight. Um, a little bit about him before we start. Carl Melantis grew up in Seaside, Oregon, a small logging town. After high school, he attended Yale University, and during his time there, he was trained in the Marine Corps platoon leaders class. He was awarded a Rhodes Scholarship at University College Oxford. He left after one semester at Oxford to join active duty in the US Marine Corps and he served in the Vietnam War 68 and 69. He later finished his master's degree in Oxford. Merlanta's earlier novel, Matterhorn, a novel of the Vietnam War, is based on his combat experience in that war and won him the 2011 Washington State Book Award in the fiction category. New York Times declared Matterhorn one of the most profound and devastating novels ever to come out of Vietnam or any other war for that matter. And uh, Carl has also written a book, a, a collection of essays called What It Is Like to Go to War. Today, we're here to talk about uh, Carl's latest book, Deep River. Uh, this was first published in July of 2019, and it follows a Finnish family who flees Finland and settles in the Pacific Northwest in a logging community. Uh, the story looks into the logging industry, labor movements of the early 1900s, and about, it's also about rebuilding a family in America while balancing family tradition. And for those of you who have not yet read the book, uh, it starts in the late 1800s in Finland where we get to meet the Koski siblings, Aino, Mati, and their brother Ilmari, who already has moved to the United States. Uh, early on, Aino and Mati joined their brother on his farm on Deep River in Washington State. And there they make new lives for themselves. And they hold on to their old traditions, cultures, and language while they learn the new traditions and um, uh, habits of the, their new country. So with that, I will turn this over to Carl and I am uh, very happy to have you here and uh, look forward to hearing what you um, 
have to say. So well, thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I wish I could see who I'm talking to. Um, get any reaction. I mean, I thought I think that uh, what Stephen and I had talked about is that I'll read uh, a, a passage from uh, Deep River just to sort of start things off. And, uh, you know, you'll have to bear with an author reading his own work. That's why they usually have someone else do it. Um, but I, uh, uh, I'll just choose a, a passage. Um, and uh, this particular scene takes place at um, a point where Aino, who is the principal character, refuses to be married to Uliko. And Aino is based on the Kalevala character Aino, and, and each of her brothers is, is based on a Kalevala character. Uh, Ilmari is Ilmarinen, the, the uh, uh, man who built the, the smith, the magic smith who built the, the Sampo, and uh, uh, each of these other characters, uh, uh, Mati is a uh, Lemminkain, and and uh, you'll see if you if you're familiar with that mythology, you will see the reflection of of each of these characters, and in in the Kalevala, Aino is is, is uh, put up for marriage by her brother, uh, uh, Wainamoinen, and uh, she refuses. And uh, in the in the myth, it's a lot more hardcore. She actually commits suicide. But it would end my novel in the first few chapters, so I have to decide to to do something else. And she has just done that. She's just broken the necklace that, that was very precious to Uliko and has left the house. And she, since her brothers had, had tried to find something for her to do because she's, she's educated, but she doesn't have any skills. She can't log, she can't fish. And when she comes to the new world, Southwest Washington at that time, uh, book learning was of very little value. And uh, I even found when I was growing up that book learning was kind of looked down on because if you couldn't set chokers or, or you know, pull in salmon, uh, you couldn't really contribute much. And so, and I'm, I'm this sort of intellectual sort of, you know, poet and, and I can always remember my relatives, oh, what, when are you gonna actually start to get serious, Marlon? So, uh, and uh, so that cult culture is very hard for someone showing up, particularly like I know. So she decides to leave and uh, she needs to find work. And she had just been at a dance the night before and had met a couple of uh, young men who were loggers and she knows that there's a logging camp and so she's on her way. And it's, uh, it's where she finally uh, finds other women to, uh, to associate with and it's, a, it's an important part of her journey. I don't know how I'm gonna do this. I think I'll, you'll just have to hear me because I can't look at the camera and look at this at the same time. Still sniffling, she set off barefoot, wearing her best skirt and blouse from the dance, cloth suitcase in her hand, shoes around her neck, her hopes high. After the first mile, she began to have doubts. All she saw was dense forest. What if there were some other trail to Nafton or Tapiola from Reader's Camp? The trees seemed to lean into the trail, squeezing it. Of, of course, that was silly. They didn't lean. She heard something crackle in the underbrush and her heart started racing. Another mile of plodding and still no trail. Her bare feet were covered in mud. The day seemed darker than when she'd left, yet it wasn't even late afternoon. She heard wind rustling the fir boughs high above her. She looked up at the dark gray clouds covering the sky above the moving treetops. She shivered, cold, despite the brisk walking and put on her coat. After about three miles, she found a well-worn trail leading west and uphill. Where else would it go except Reader's Camp? When she lost sight of the Napton Trail, she lost sight of anything familiar. A raven, startled from its roost, croaked its deep crow-like caw and flew just feet above her head, disappearing into the forest. The raven filled her with foreboding. She fought down childish superstition. The trail now paralleled a creek. The water was dark, filled with silt. It didn't seem natural. She realized she hadn't eaten since the night before and had packed no food. What if she never found Reader's Camp? Should she turn back now to avoid getting trapped in the dark? Turn back to where? Her evaporating sweat chilled her. 
The slate gray overcast weighed on her shoulders, pressing her down into the forest floor. Then it started to rain. She was overwhelmed with what she had done. She had refused a proposal of marriage rather badly, hurting the man in the process. She'd quit her job and was now hungry in a forest that seemingly had no end. She'd set off for some place she didn't know how to find. She had no shelter. She was getting soaked and the day moved relentlessly toward night. She had no way to see in the dark. She plopped down next to the creek, not caring about the mud on her good skirt. She thought about going back to Ilma Henke, that's her brother's farm, or apologizing to Ulako, the man she refused. She couldn't. She thought about how she'd gotten to this lonely place where farms were so new, the farmers sowed their grain around stumps and their little houses were dwarfed by enormous trees. Her thoughts went back to Finland, where the landscape was on a human scale. Would she ever see her parents again? She fought down the memories of her dead sisters and brother. Then the horrible prison time once again intruded on her memory. She started to sob. Aino looked through tears at the sullen clouds above her, all around her, tree after tree, for mile upon mile upon mile, made her feel small, helpless, and alone. She thought of wrapping her shawl around her head, covering her face, and throwing herself into the murky drip to drown. Movement caught her eye, and she imagined more than heard a soft flutter of wings. A northern pygmy owl, about half a foot tall, had silently emerged from a hiding place at the edge of the uncut forest. It swooped down, hitting the ground by the creek with a thud. Wings beating at the cool air, the owl climbed to the top of a snag and turned its head, staring straight at her with its fierce, immovable eyes. A field mouse hung in its beak. It began to feed on the mouse, occasionally jerking up, swiveling its head to stare at her briefly, making sure she wasn't a threat. It hooted warning her to stay clear. She laughed. Ilmery would say the owl represented their mother's spirit coming to scold her for forgetting her sisu. Around mid-afternoon beneath high clouds from the Pacific climbing over the cooler air of the vast forest, she hit the rail line linking Reader's Camp to Willapa Bay. The rain had stopped, but the sun stayed hidden, its presence signaled only by lighter gray in the southwest sky before her. The forest was cast in continuous shadow. She turned south on the railroad tracks, stepping on cedar cross ties, taking in their soft, sweet smell. She guessed that to save money, Reader had not bothered to creosote them as major railroads did. The untreated cedar would last long enough for him to cut out the timber. After following the tracks as they climbed into the hills another three or four miles, she heard women's voices. They were speaking thin. She hurried towards them. Coming around a gentle curve in the rail line, she faced a large, seemingly haphazard bridge made of log after log, piled one upon another from the bottom of a small logged off canyon with a fast flowing creek where three girls around her age were washing clothes. The music of their voices blended with the music of the stream. Occasional laughter bubbled up to her, standing there bedraggled on the rail line in her wet and muddy Sunday best. <clears throat> One of the girls saw her and spoke beneath her breath to the other two. They looked at Aino, skirts tucked above their knees, feet in the cold water. Aino recognized two of them from the dance the night before. Paiva, the first girl shouted up to her, short for Hula Paiva, good day. Paiva, she shouted back. She looked down, took a deep breath, and began the steep slide down the hill. By the time she'd reached them, she'd snagged her blouse on a blackberry vine and strained an ankle when she caught her foot on her skirt hem and fallen. The girl who'd shouted to her giggled, pointing at her clothes. You're going to the wrong place for a dance, girl. Plenty of men up here, but no music. I'm looking for work. Oh, the girl said. Can you cook? I know, hesitated. Sure. What Finn woman can't cook? Yeah, well, cooking for a husband is different for, from cooking for a hundred loggers. And they can eat, one of the others broke in. 
You would never believe it possible how they can eat. All three of them laughed again. Aino smiled. She hadn't realized until just now how much she had missed girls of her own age. She remembered the dance, all the girls primping at the mirror, adjusting skirts, flattening blouses to reveal curves, knowing they were in a situation where none of them could lose. But here they were working, doing what women did, washing clothes, talking, laughing, being right with the world and full of life. Aino sat down and put her tired feet and sore ankle in the water. She walked about 10 miles barefoot in wet clothes, the last three or four on splintered rail ties. The girls folded the clothes, bundling them with sheets and throwing them still damp over their backs to haul back up to camp. It's about 400 yards, the first girl said. She used the American measure. Around the curve, she said, nodding with her chin. She was taller than I know, but younger, not yet fully developed. She was not beautiful, but not ugly, pleasant looking. There was no fat on her, nor was there any on the other girls, but she wasn't thin. She looked strong in a girlish way. You ask for Alma Vitola, the girl continued. Alma Vitola is from my home place, Aino said, excitement growing. We're shirt tail relatives. Yeah, well, good. Uh, you tell her Lempi Rompinen also gave you her name. She paused just slightly. That's me, she said softly, Lempi. Warmth seemed to flow from inside out through her blue eyes. The two girls regarded each other just enough for each to know that for some inexplicable reason, here was someone who could be a friend, even though you'd known her no more than a minute. Lempi's voice came back to full volume. She hires and supervises the flunkies. She used the American word. That's what the loggers call us girls who work in the mess hall. Her eyes ran up and down Aino. You can make yourself presentable here. She looked down at Aino's feet. And put your shoes on so you don't look so desperate. And as you can guess, Lempi becomes a major friend of Aino's and she's, you know, she's a, a major character throughout the rest of the novel. Thank you, Carl. That's a great um, passage from your book. Um, so um, if you want to talk a little bit about, so I know is um, inspired by your grandmother, although a fictional character. Uh, how did you start this? You know, how much of the book is uh, inspired by your family and how did you come to think about writing this? Well, you know, I grew up, then Seaside was a logging town, you know, and, uh, and, and we were still cutting old growth when I was a kid. Uh, I, I can remember, I really remember in grade school, we would feel the floor tremble as the log trucks roared through town because they, they were paid by the load. And so those, those truck drivers, they didn't dawdle. I mean, and I, I'm sure that Sid Smith, who was the local cop, got a percentage or something because he never gave him a ticket for <laughs> going through town at 40 miles an hour. And, uh, but the floor would tremble and there would be one log on the truck, one, because that was all it could carry. And today a log truck, you'll see them on the highway, they have 35 or 40 logs on them, same size truck. So just to give you an idea of what the change has been in the forest. And I, I wanted to sort of capture that a little bit. It was part, part of what we basically threw away and uh, try to capture that. Um, in Clatsop County, where I grew up, which is the northwest corner of Oregon, Astoria, seaside, that area, um, the peak cut was in 1972. I mean, people think that the old growth was sort of cut out in the 1890s. Not true. It was just that you had to go further and further to get to it. And uh, as we got trucks replacing trains and trains replacing oxen and the and chainsaws, I remember talking to my great uncle, Yuka, and uh, he said they, he remembers talking in the bunkhouse once. He said they decided they could never cut out Clatsop County. They just couldn't because they couldn't cut it faster than it would grow back. And he said, then some German invented something called a chainsaw. And that, uh, that's, that's technology. And I, I wanted to deal with that. The other thing is, is of course, I had, I, my mother's, her first language is Finnish. My father's is Greek. And uh, people wonder, well, how, how does this guy have a name like Marlanis and write about Finns? Well, it's because my father's first language was Greek. And uh, it, it was really sort of amazing. And I wanted to sort of capture this too, because it's unusual. Um, 
Mother speaks Finnish. Father speaks Greek. Mother's father was a Norwegian named Leif Erikson. And of course, her mother was Finnish and her, her name was Aina, uh, from Aino, as I used her name. And uh, so Greek and Finnish and, and Norwegian uh, and uh, all, all those languages batting around the house at the same time. And my, my brother, older brother, finally, he told me one day, he says, you know, we just live in cultural schizophrenia. <laughs> <laughs> and the result of that was that we just, we, just, we, we just resorted to English because it was the only way we could, the only thing we had in common. But I, the music of those languages is in my ears. And uh, that was important to me. And, and my grandmother was a real character. I mean, she was, uh, uh, she worked, you know, uh, in the canneries. Uh, she, 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 she canned, she, she cooked in the logging camps. Uh, she sometimes would help my grandfather, who was a fisherman. And, and my brother and I both fished commercially with my grandfather uh, on the Columbia gill netting. And uh, she was a member of the IWW, uh, and and she was a communist, uh, unrepentant communist. I mean, and uh, I didn't know what that meant. But one of one of my first memories was I I was in Astoria, you know, staying at Grandma's house, and I met a little friend. I was probably about eight, and I brought him over to the house, and I go, you know, "Hey, Grandma, you know, it's my new friend." And and she looked at this kid, and she said, "You get out of here. You go home." And <laughs> And uh, what, you know, and I'm sort of stunned, you know, how come you sent my friend away? And she turned to him and she said, they're church Finns, they're whites, we don't deal with them. <laughs> and that was left over from the Finnish uh, Civil War. Uh, and that, that, was those, that was the 50s and the feelings were still that high that my grandmother wouldn't let me play with someone who wasn't a red. Uh, I had no idea what, what all that meant. It's just that, well, I guess I can't deal with this kid. Somehow there's something wrong with being a church fan. And uh, she, uh, <laughs> another thing I, I laugh about is that she, she of course got the Daily Worker, uh, which was the paper of the American Communist Party, and it was always there on the kitchen table. I always thought the Daily Worker was the local Astoria paper until I was probably about in the eighth grade or something like that. <laughs> And, and I always kind of giggle because people, especially in the 50s, uh, you know, communists were, you know, devils with horns. And, uh, and of course, you know, there was an attempt by the Russian Communist Party to take over the world. And, and the ideals of communism had long been subverted. And my grandmother had to deal with that. And she didn't deal with it well. Uh, but one of the things that, that triggered the novel also was I, I came home from college and some of you are of the age that you remember Joan Baez uh, singing about Joe Hill. I dreamed I saw Joe Hill last night alive as you and me. And you know, it was a famous song about this, this uh, radical organizer of the IWW. And, uh, and he was of course a very important figure. I mean, he, he was a, a he, wrote song parodies, which, uh, you know, and, and uh, the pie in the sky when you die is, is from Joe Hill uh, and uh, solidarity forever is from Joe Hill. So I, I thought, oh, wow, grandma was in the IWW. And so I, I'd come home and I said, grandma, did you know Joe Hill? And she literally took a step backward and set her jaw and she said, that son of a bitch. <laughs> and I thought, what? This is a 60s icon we're talking about here. You know, yeah. Joan Baez made him famous. And, and I said, what? what? And she said, we would work so hard to get guys to carry the red card. And uh, if you joined the IWW, uh, you were issued a red card, which, uh, you know, uh, made you a member of the group. And, uh, and it was dues. And, uh, but it was illegal. If you got caught being a member of the IWW, you were not just fired. Uh, you were blacklisted and so that meant you you and your family if you had a family were really up the creek because there, you could never get it work anywhere around any of the local logging camps you'd have to move across the country with a no new name so it was scary stuff and these were brave guys to to carry the red card and she said we would work two years sometimes three years to to build up the membership 
And then Joe Hill would show up and he would be at, at a rally and there would be, he would be singing songs. And he said, and she said, cops from all over the county would be standing around. The loggers are scared to death. They're tearing up and there's torn up red cards all over the ground. And Joe Hill leaves the next morning. So, so her view of him was really different than the, the traditional one. And, uh, I, of course, researched him a little bit. I, I, he, you know, he had clay feet. I mean, there was no doubt that Joe Hill wasn't the uh, pure icon that uh, the song talks about. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, so I thought, well, there's an interesting character and an interesting take. And so that kind of stuff all started the logging, my grandmother, uh, her experiences, stories from my great uncles. They were all loggers. Uh, I fished, uh, so I know fishing really well. Uh, and my grandmother's brothers all homesteaded uh, in Nacelle, which is just, oh, it's about seven or eight miles from the Columbia River in Southwest Washington on, on the Nacelle River. But I didn't like the name Nacelle River, so, I, so I, I borrowed Deep River and I apologized to all the locals. I said, I know it's eight miles east, but believe me, I do know where it is. I just, I just couldn't imagine a book called Nacelle River, <laughs> selling <laughs> well, and, and Deep Thank River also, yeah, it also refers to the Columbia, and uh, there's a lot of, I don't know, mysticism in the book, and Ilmari, who is a traditional uh, evangelical Lutheran, uh, moves toward mysticism, and Aino, who is a communist and an and a, uh, atheist, all of the brothers have a different way of looking at the world, being in the world. I, I sort of you know, borrowed this from Kierkegaard. It's no, nothing I invented, but you know, Kierkegaard talks about these categories of being like um, the religious, uh, the aesthetic, the ethical. And because of something that happens, if you read the novel you'll, in the very beginning, each of the children comes away with a different attitude. And yet they're in the same family. Uh, one of them is is uh, uh, just wants to get rich. He thinks that if I get wealthy enough, I can stave off the anxiety of death. Uh, that's Matty. Ilmari goes to traditional religion, but meets people that moves him toward a more mystical view throughout the novel. Uh, Matty uh, was was the one that wanted to get rich. And I know, uh, you know, just believes no one's coming. Uh, and uh, her experience is no one's coming. So she's got to do it herself. And I know means the only one. And that's from the Kalevala. She stood alone all the time. And that's her, her stance in life, which we will see. She does have a character arc there as well. I mean, one friend of mine said, Carl, you, you've, you've written a, a, a female character who is more frustrating than Scarlett O'Hara. <laughs> <laughs> but and, uh, I, I think it's interesting you say that about Aino because there's one part in the book where she stands outside and looks into on everybody inside. And uh, it was kind of looks like a metaphor. She wasn't part, you know, she was part of the family, but she's kind of looking at them from the outside. Yeah, that's right. No, and, and her struggle is, is to uh, overcome her, some of her childhood uh, mm -hmm. problems. And, and of course, she, she, uh, 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 you know, is very attracted to uh, Yuka, who is Yuka kind uh, Yuka Hainan, uh, and he's very much into, you know, wine, women, and song. It's another way that people deal with the world. I mean, let's go golfing. I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it, and, and that'll, maybe that'll stave off the anxiety that we might die. And uh, so, and, and of course, then there's Axel, who's more the ethical, he's other oriented all the time. And that's the ethical stance. Uh, and all of these characters have to live together. They're in a family. And I, I was very much aware that you can have incredibly different religious views. I mean, she's got a brother, Matthew, who wants to get rich. He's a capitalist to the core and he'll cheat and steal just to, to try and get ahead. And here she is trying to organize the IWW to take down capitalism. And yet they have Thanksgiving dinner together. And, and I'm going like, it's a bit metaphorical. It's like, you know, we have a country that now is just split completely apart. 
And why can't we manage to be adults and say, well, this is one way of looking at it. And this is another way. And okay, well, there's a bigger good here. The family is more important than, than each individual, but uh, we can get along uh, in spite of the fact that we have these very vastly different views. And so there's always a struggle in the Kosky family between these different mm -hmm. viewpoints. Uh, and they even immigrated because of different reasons. I mean, Maddie left because he, he got in trouble with the police and he didn't want to get uh, drafted and neither did Ilmarie. I know uh, left because she was, she wanted to get out from underneath czarist rule and uh, a lot of people left because of just plain poverty. I mean, my grandmother talks about in her childhood, knowing about the great famines uh, and we didn't have famines in America. That was one thing that, that America always seemed to have was food. I mean, and, and uh, they ran out of food in places like Europe and, and it just didn't happen in America. It was like, to those people, it was like, holy moly, what a wonderful place. There's, you can just go out and shoot something and eat it, you know? I mean, and uh, coming to the Northwest like that, it was a very, uh, you know, I, I know my, my, again, my great uncles and my grandfather said that they would just look at the trees and they would go like, holy moly, that that tree is worth you know forty trees in Finland. Why God? I mean, they just sort of thought life was on steroids around here, and and we tend to just take it all for granted. Not to mention the fact that we cut it all down and uh, and didn't even think about it. And so all that is mixed into the novel. I um I, I think it's interesting as you mentioned the the siblings are they really represent all those push and pull factors of. Uh, why the immigrants came over during the Great Migration. And uh, I think um, your book is so amazing. It's a long book. It's a thick book. And it's so... Only um, 700 pages. Yes. And it's <laughs> so... It's it's wonderful. But um, it's it's part family drama, part love story. And But there's it's it strikes me as very well researched. So how did you go about um, doing the research for this and how long did it take you, both the research and the writing? Well, it's hard to sort of judge the writing because I had gotten involved in a lot of, uh, after Matterhorn and uh, hit it big and, and uh, 35 years of trying to get it published, uh, finally it, it, it got published and, and did hit the New York Times uh, and so did what it's like. Uh, then I was doing a lot of documentaries. And so I was working on Deep River in between. So it took seven years. Well, yes, it was 11. Yeah, about seven years in, in linear time, <clears throat> but I wasn't working on it full time. I would just uh, do these other things like the Ken Burns documentary, mm -hmm. Vietnam and high definition and various things. Uh, and so over a, a seven year period. And one of the things that, that I, I did is I just read a lot uh, to get a feel for the time, um, the labor movement, uh, history of the labor movement, the IWW. I had a lot of uh, firsthand experience, like just talking to my great uncles and, and, you know, I grew up in a logging town. I mean, you, you knew what a choker was, but you just, you just had to, I mean, it was just the way it was. And I knew about fishing. So that part of the research, I didn't have to worry about, but what was it like in 1905? Well, I would just talk to friends of mine. I mean, you know, I had I had a cousin, uh, uh, Brian, who who is a logger, but he happens to know a lot about uh, the old ways. And so I would just call him on the phone. And, and I have another friend who had his own logging company, George Nelson, who I played football with. And I, I remember thinking I had to have some way of cheating because Maddie had to cheat. So I called George up. I said, it's 1910, George, how would you cheat? And he told me three ways, you know, and so, and then like the clothing, there's a, a woman here in, in, in uh, Seattle who r makes courses and, and uh, she is into historical clothing. And so I, whenever I would run into something like, well, I think this is a point where, you know, uh, like, for example, when I know came back from Chicago, uh, uh, you know, well, what, what, what were the skirt lengths? Uh, and, and, so I called up this friend and she said, the surprising thing is, is that when she came back, the skirt lengths were going down 
our assumption is they always go up. And she said, no, they were going down because they now could afford the cloth after the First World War mm -hmm. and the style had changed. And so I know shows up in a skirt that's short at the knees and of course is completely out of it uh, because it should have been long. And so those things I, I get because I talk to my friends and, and I get those tidbits. And, uh, uh, and I'll, I'll hit a, a, something in a plot and I'll go like, we need to get more color here. I just have to put more color here because otherwise it's sort of drab, it's sort of dead, I could feel it. And so then I would, I would just, the internet's wonderful. In fact, it's, it's dangerous. I mean, because <laughs> I would do something like, okay, like, all right, what was a skirt length in 1920? Type, 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 you know, and then I'd sort of see that. And then, then there would be a, a, a link to, uh, lingerie in 1920. <laughs> oh, that was kind of cool, you know, dip, tip, 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 tip. And then, I mean, you got, I mean, an hour later, you know, it's like, I'm supposed to be writing a novel. I'm sort of lost in internet land. And so <laughs> it's a great tool, but it's also a wonderful procrastination. Yeah. Procrastination. And I have to say, in, in your book at the end, you thank Sherry's Cafe in Bend, Oregon, I think. How well, it's much, in Cannon Beach. Yeah. Cannon Beach. How, how, much did, how long did, how much were you actually there? <laughs> oh, you know, I wrote a lot in Sherry's because uh, I have a house in Cannon Beach. It's where I grew up. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, it's where my, hang, my friends from high school still hang out, the ones that are still around, and the, the ones that stayed there and logged and, or fished. A lot of them are dory fishermen. Uh, or or guild matters and uh, and so I would go into Sherry's and we just had a deal I'd just go into one of the booths I'm one of those people I, I tend to like to to write uh, when there's sort of background noise mm -hmm. going on I don't know why it just works for me and not only that but my friends show up and they know to leave me alone I'm sort of over there you know doing my <laughs> Bill and Thomas said writing is a what do you call it a lonely and sullen craft <laughs> and uh, it is you just you're all by yourself but the other thing is they keep you honest. I mean, one of the things was I, I laugh. You talk about the length of the novel. Uh, I had, when I when I sent it in, it was uh, the first draft was big, three hundred and fifty thousand words. I mean, the current draft's like two hundred and twenty. So I mean, it's like you know, way shorter. And uh, I sent it in to Morgan Entrigan, president of Grove, and nothing. I didn't hear anything from. Him. I didn't hear anything from him. Seven weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks went by. I finally got a six word email from Morgan. Great stuff, too much of it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, Morgan. I said, how, how, well, how much is too much? I said, God, it's 350,000 words. Anna Karenina is 351,000. And there's a pause and he says, Carl, I could never sell Anna Karenina today. And you're not Tolstoy. <laughs> Yes. But anyway, so I, so talking about my friends, so and I, I said, well, I have to cut 100,000 words. And I, I was sort of moaning, I, said, I got 100,000 words. And John Rogers, is, who's at the end of the bar at Sherry's Cafe, turns to me, he says, Carl, he says, that's going to be dead easy. Huh? He says, he just, just, just put in 100 pictures. Every picture is worth 1,000 words. <laughs> so, it's really nice to have these friends of yours from way back before, you know, you were, you were, quote, a known author. Yeah, I think we're gonna uh, I'm gonna switch to getting taking a few questions here from. Um, so he, let's see. Someone asks here: Did you visit Wobbly Graves in Kelso and Centralia? And what surprised you most as you researched? Did I did I, did I visit where? Um, Wobbly Graves in Kelso no, and no. Centralia. I didn't visit the graves, but I definitely went to Centralia to 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 see what the where the streets were and the layout. For example, you know, I, in the, in the, the action scene of the Centralia massacre, I knew because I, you know, a Marine, and I could I looked at the terrain and I could see where the right where the guys with rifles would be set up. And and if I hadn't have walked those streets, I wouldn't have been able to, to do that. But I, I didn't go visit the graves. No. Uh, so this uh, this is a question that we didn't um, touch on this. So thank you for posing this question. Um, someone here, Lori, asks, "Tell us your background on vows." I can't pronounce it. Vows um, Vausati Tati. Uh, that's her favorite character. Vasutati. Vasutati. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. oh. um, you know, when I grew up in Seaside, there was a, a, a an Indian woman in town that we called Indian Jenny. 
And uh, she lived at a place called Indian Place, which now is a trailer court called Indian Place. But she was said to be the last of the Clatsop Indians. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. She was also said to be a Clatsop Indian princess. And, and there were all, there's all kinds of mythology around Indian Jenny. And, and, and uh, I, I, she, was, she fascinated me. And I would go down and I'd try to talk to Indian Jenny, you know. And uh, so she was in my mind. And what, what's going on with Indian Jenny uh, and then Vasutati is, is uh, Vasutati means anti basket. Uh, and the Finns would call her that because she had to make a living somehow. She is the last of the Nacelle tribe, which were a Chinookan offshoot that actually lived in Nacelle. That's where the name Nacelle comes from, the Nacelle Indians. Um, and uh, she represents the dying of the uh, Native American cultures and, and how they were uh, overwhelmed by the the new cultures coming in uh and and one of the point i don't think i give anything away but uh ilmarie's child uh, it learns how to do very intricate basket weaving from vasutati and it's not just how to build baskets it's very sort of zen in the art of archery it's it's a it's a meditation it's a it's a training in, in uh, mandalas. It's, a, it's, it's very, very serious. Basket weaving is just making something to hold popcorn. But when, when Vasutati passes and, uh, and the little, little girl who's learning it uh, uh, also doesn't make it, it, it it's the, it, that's the symbolism of the loss of this, of what we've lost from these cultures. And, and, uh, even though the current Native Americans are trying very hard to bring it back and preserve it, uh, unfortunately, I think that a great deal of it has been lost. But just as we've lost our own uh, earlier uh, hunter-gatherer cultures and mythologies and stuff, I mean, they're gone. And uh, so again, that's part of the novel is what what we've lost and uh, trying to sort of, you know, think, well, maybe we should try and preserve a little bit of what's left of, what, of the forest, of the cultures that, that we've overwhelmed. Um, I, let's see, sorry, I have to scroll up her. Thank you. Um, oh, I had a question here. Uh, it's from Susan. Similar to Grapes of Wrath, you have written a complicated story that begins and ends with women as the strongest central character. Please discuss your thoughts, Kitos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we were just talking about this before, uh, so it's interesting, it's on people's minds. Um, Matterhorn was, of course, about young men. I mean, Marines are really young. I mean, the average age in my platoon was 18 and 10 months. That's the average. Uh, and I dealt with what young men deal with. And as, as we grow, uh, hopefully we, we develop. And uh, what is happening, I know, in my own psychology is that, you know, people make jokes about it, uh, getting in touch with your feminine side. That's actually there's something very serious about that. I think that we don't become complete human beings until we uh, develop our contrasexual sides. Uh, and it's not easy. I mean, because sometimes you can fall into it. I mean, you know, become sort of a fake woman uh, or a fake man. Uh, how do you how do you negotiate that? Be but if you don't do that, you're you're basically uh, arriving at death empty. Uh, instead of a, as a complete human being. So writing for me is, is, is kind of a spiritual exercise. And so the, the female characters are clearly, in my opinion, they're coming from me. You know, I, don't, I don't pull them out. They come from inside of me. So they're part of me. And so as I write, uh, those parts of my psyche develop. And I, I, I think that that's probably what, what uh, has... Um, motivated me in, in many ways to write about, you know, female characters. Um, and, um, you know, I think I got them mostly right. And the other thing is I, I have three daughters and, uh, and my wife, and they keep me pretty straight and narrow. I mean, when they read something, they'll go like, oh, God, no girl would ever say that. Oh, okay. What would she say? So I, I, I have, I have course correction all the time because of my, my, female relative, uh, you know, 
uh, close family. Uh, so, um, what reception has the book received in Finland or Scandinavia? I, I, haven't heard, I haven't heard a thing. I don't even know if they know about it. No, I, 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 di I did look, um, so I'm from Sweden and it, it is uh, available in Sweden, but in English, so. Yeah, but, yeah, it's certainly not been translated. No. Matterhorn was translated into 14 different languages and uh, uh, but I, uh, Deep River is, has a contract in French and Italian and Dutch, mm -hmm. uh, but none of the Scandinavian languages. But the other thing is, is that they, the English uh, publisher uh, has the rights to all the European countries. And because, I mean, I, it's embarrassing how, how, how well people speak English in places like Sweden and Finland and Norway. That you know? is very true. So I, don't, I don't think it's much of a stretch for them to read an English novel. Uh, I had, a, let's see here. Um, did your Greek heritage influence the use of Greek loggers as scabs during the strike? I quite like the character and felt that although he and his comrades were scabs, you treated them fairly. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the things that was really interesting is, is in my family, the struggle of the Greek side and the Finnish side. I mean, you, you, you just got to imagine this, okay? You go to the Greek Orthodox Church. I mean, I'd go there with my grandmother and, and I was baptized Greek Orthodox because, you know, that you had to do it. I mean, otherwise grandma would be very excited. And my other grandma was Nick Congress. Uh, I mean, you go there and, and it's just chaos. I mean, there, you know, women are shouting across the, the whole church. Sophia, I haven't seen you for so long. How's your kids? How are they doing? You know, this is right in the middle of church service. You know, the, the priests up there, you know, with the incense and the uh, everything going on like that. Well, then you go to the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Finland and everybody's just <laughs> complete silence, you know. I mean, this is really serious business, you know, what we're doing here. Well, you have these two cultures coming together, and I love to tell this story. My my mother and father met uh, at a bowling match uh, in Spokane uh, just before the Second World War, and because my dad was uh, in uh, was going to get called up, they thought, well, we better get married, and so they decided to get married. Well. My grandmother, my Finnish grandmother, thought that Greeks were black people, and 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 they were they were stupid Christians. They were superstitious people, and they were dirty because they didn't have a sauna. And uh, so, there was, I mean, her view of it was was that. And she said, "I'm not condoning this marriage. I'm not even going to go to the wedding." And she she refused to go to the wedding. My Greek grandmother knew that my father was marrying, you know, a Finn whose mother was a communist and an atheist. And he was marrying outside of the Orthodox Church, which in the Greek church, if you marry outside of the church, it's an anathema, which means you go to hell. And so my Greek grandmother arrived at the church, which they did in Longview, in mourning clothes and sat outside and wailed the death song for my dad as they were as they were coming out of the church because she knew that her son was doomed to hell forever okay that was the start so you think about these two cultures joined together in, in my family they eventually you know started to realize they were both sides were human and and uh, by the time i was in high school you, we would even occasionally have a have a christmas dinner where where you know, both uh, Yaya and, and Grandma would, would be at the same table, but it took some doing. <laughs> uh, yeah, your family is the UN. <laughs> yeah. It was a, a question from Tom here. You, Tom got his um, question uh, answered. Was it a scandal back when your, when your parents got married? And um, you answered that. It was, yeah. um, but it ended well. So and I just wanted to go back to the question about the scabs. Uh, the the Greeks and the Italians and I think to some some extent uh, the Croatians were the outsiders because the the majority of the loggers were Scandinavians and uh, they did not appreciate people coming into you know, lower wages and one of the things that that I found fascinating is that you think well the socialists are all sort of for inclusion and and we're all one big family well it was the socialists that threw the Chinese out. 
uh, they absolutely uh, got rid of the of the Chinese in the Northwest uh, through the usual methods uh, because they were just afraid that they would just lower the wages and and uh, so that was also just going on all the time and these people uh, they needed they needed to feed their families too and so I I have a view of scabs it's not exactly orthodox uh, uh, and and because of the Greek side that that was what uh, they faced when they came because they were literally the Scandinavians called them, you know, thought they were a different color. I mean, it's just fascinating how, you know, the same problems, the same problems that we have today, we just are reenacting them. I mean, humans are just humans. Yeah. Hopefully we'll learn. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, so there is a question here about, uh, are you writing anything more on Finland? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really interesting. The current current novel is set in Helsinki in 1947, and the the principal character is the wife of uh, uh, Arnie Koski. And in in Deep River, Arnie is a little four year old uh, who wants to be a soldier and uh, First World War, and he's he's shouting, "Kill the Bosch!" and and uh, that's all you that's all you see of Arnie. But he goes to West Point and becomes a, a, a career military officer. And because he speaks Finnish, he becomes a military attache to Finland in 1947. And that was when Russia controlled Finland. I mean, they had a peace treaty with Finland and Finland did, you know, uh, fend them off in the winter war. And, but then the, the, the Russians came back and Finland had to side with, with Germany, which was very hard on them because they didn't really, most of them did not believe in what the German ideology, but they, they had the Russians wanting to take over the country. And they had a, an onerous peace treaty uh, in 1944 with terrible reparations that the Finns had to, had to uh, pay. And... Um, it was a time when Russia was trying to take over all the Eastern European countries. So there's a lot of intrigue. So I set it back in that time period. And the, uh, the essence of the, of the novel is that the Russian military attache and, and Arnie Kosky, who's the American, decide in a, just a drunken party, two professional officers who are great skiers, to have a 500 kilometer ski race just between the two of them. Well, Arnie's wife, Louise, who is a classic American, and in a way, I, she represents the naivete of, of Americans. I mean, when Americans go to war, it's on ABC and CNN like it's a football game. And, and we have this view of life that's, in my opinion, just really naive. And she, the Russian wife uh, is very different. Louise decides to have a raffle to raise money for an orphanage, which, you know, is a good idea. Great. And so she has this great raffle idea and she, she does a typical American thing. She does publicity to the newspapers and she writes letters and she gets gins up all kinds of advertising about this race between the two and the two guys are unaware of this. And the deal is that whoever guesses the dis the difference between the winner and the loser closest gets a hundred thousand mark, which is like about three hundred dollars. Well, it goes the equivalent of viral, and it reaches the Kremlin. And the Russian's wife realizes that if her husband, who happens to be a hero of the Soviet Union, loses this race, they're dead. And Louise finally realizes this, and then it's oh my God, how am I going to try and turn this around? There's no, the, the deal with the race was no roads. And so the two guys are skiing where there's no roads. No one knows where they are. How is she going to reach her husband to get him to throw the race? Can she do it? And so that's the, that's the, the essence of the book. We can't wait to read that book too. Uh, so I, I have a last question here. Um, uh, this is from Kathy. Growing up in Aberdeen in the 1950s, I was a bit upset that Aberdeen became Nordland. Did the Nacelle <laughs> people really feel that way? We used to drive to Astoria monthly to home bakery. Well, quite frankly, yeah, yeah I mean, I don't know if, 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 if she under, knows the history of Aberdeen. It was a tough town back in the day. I mean, it was a town that, that, that uh, was uh, pretty wild. Uh, so it wasn't just that the people from Nacelle saw it that way. 
I mean, in the 50s, Aberdeen was nothing like that. But in 1910, there was Shanghai going on, there was brothels, there was corruption. I mean, the, the chief of police in Aberdeen was the, was the major guy doing the Shanghai. Uh, and I mean, so it was, it was a tough logging town uh, from about, you know, late 19th century through the very early 20th century. So uh, I apologize if you feel uh, offended, but history is history, and uh, there's no getting around. Aberdeen start was was pretty rocky. Yeah. Uh, anyways, we can't wait to uh, read what else you have written. But I also want to mention something you've uh, told me that uh, the Finlandia Foundation chapter in here in Seattle, I believe, or or uh, the local Finlandia Foundation chapter Portland. are. Uh, making a uh, documentary about Deep River. Yes, yeah, it's 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 the Portland uh, one, and uh, they they had given there's an award given. I can't remember the name of it, but uh, uh, for writing it, and, and I was to go around to various chapters in in uh, the United States, and they had a budget for that. Well, COVID put a kibosh on that, and so they decided to take the travel budget and try to make a little documentary, and so. They're going to do that, and we're going to shoot it in September. And uh, it's, I mean, there's not enough money to, to do a, a major piece of work here, but I'll be a talking head, and we're going to try and get pictures from the old country and, uh, you know, sort of do a Ken Burns kind of uh, look at things. And, uh, and Yeah, we look forward to watching that. And I think the award was the, was it the Sauna, Sauna Bucket Award? The Sauna Bucket Award, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, oh, and, and I apologize here. It's the Finlandia Foundation National Project. That's it. Yeah. Yes. So uh, I want to thank you so much, um, Carl, for being here with us today. Uh, loved your book. Look forward to ha hosting you at the museum when we can do so live. But uh, for now, I think this, is, this has been great. I want to thank you. I want to thank everybody who joined us today and uh, hope to see everybody at other events at the museum virtually or live when we can and with that i wish you all a good night and uh, thank you again yeah thanks very much thank you